So my talk is going to be on um, um, an, um, an issue that uh, has recently um, attracted um, um, some attention from um, philosophers working uh, on uh, the epistemology of scientific models. And uh, you see from the title, uh, Learning Through the Scientific Imagination, it's uh, a talk that will um, uh, explore uh, the uh, possibility of learning through the sort of imagination that uh, is uh, involved in modeling. And um, um, this is my area of uh, research at the moment, my main area. Uh, okay, the question that I want to um, uh, ask, I want to start with, and I will uh, start by asking this question now, uh, I will refine it in a moment, is the following. So how do we learn about reality through scientific models? So scientific models are widely held as sources of knowledge of reality. Um, and um, uh, they are often discussed as uh, uh, epistemic tools that are used in scientific practices uh, for different purposes, for explaining uh, certain real world phenomena, for making predictions about them, uh, for uh, perhaps exploring um, uh, possible ways uh, things could be. Uh, and uh, imagination uh, seems to play an important role uh, in, this, um, in this practice. Um, answering the question, uh, how do we learn about reality through scientific models, uh, requires um, that we make first a distinction between two types of models. We have, um, this is a standard distinction, it's not one that I, uh, um, that I make. Uh, we have, on the one hand, material models, which are physical, concrete objects. Uh, for example, um, uh, Crick and Watson's DNA molecular model, uh, which is um, made of uh, metal uh, rods and uh, rods and plates, and it's a it's a physical material object. And then we have theoretical models, uh, models that are usually identified uh, or uh, construed as uh, mathematical objects objects that do not exist as concrete entities. And uh, in some cases, they are also called fictional objects. This is uh, a word that is used in the Stanford Encyclopedia entry on uh, models in science by uh, Frigg and Hartmann, by Roman Frigg and Stefan Hartmann. Uh, in this case, we have an example, uh, Maxwell's ideal gas model, a very simple uh, uh, model that will um, that I will use to illustrate some of the ideas that I will present in this talk, and uh, the model is usually identified with uh, this um, uh, mathematical equation. It's a simple mathematical equation, and um, uh, the equation in itself, I should emphasize this, uh, is not a model of anything as a mathematical object in itself. It becomes a model, a scientific model, a model when it is used uh, under some interpretation. In this particular case, the interpretation uh, involves uh, the following assignments, let's say. So we have uh, that uh, the symbol, uh, P stands for uh, pressure, V stands for volume, N stands for the number of moles uh, in the gas, R uh, stands for uh, the gas constant, and then we have temperature. Now to enable this uh, mathematical equation, um, we have to make some idealizing assumptions. So we um, uh, consider uh, a gas that is composed of uh, point particles. These point particles have, uh, as point particles, they have no volume in and of themselves. Also, they do not um, exert any intermolecular forces. And um, when they bounce against the wall uh, of the container uh, or against each other, 
uh, they do these inelastic collisions, which means that they do not lose any uh, kinetic uh, energy. Um, this means, sorry, I have to move the bar. Okay, here we are, because I have it okay, on the slide. This means that what this equation um, uh, specifies and uh, together with the idealizations I just mentioned um, is a, um, a system, a gas that um, does not exist um, as uh, any real gas. So no real gas has these properties the uh, gas that is described by this uh, equation is a, an imaginary or fictional gas, one that does not exist. Now, this is um, generally accepted, okay? Um, now, the question um, that uh, we're asking is how do we learn about reality through scientific models? And uh, Mary Morgan, originally uh, introduced this idea that learning with models involves two steps, uh, model building and uh, model manipulation. In the case of uh, material models, uh, this uh, seems to uh, be unproblematic. Uh, material models are used in um, uh, experimental uh, settings and uh, the sorts of questions that they raise with respect to um, uh, their epistemology and how we learn with them have nothing uh, special to do with the models. They are just questions that um, uh, are raised, general questions that are raised by um, our um, um, uh, epistemology of uh, experiments. So nothing special about the models themselves, uh, but rather about the experiments. So this is unproblematic from the point of view of modeling. Uh, the problematic case is um, uh, provided by theoretical models, okay? Uh, so this is where we um, uh, find uh, a genuine uh, specific problem. Uh, and the problem is the following. So um, uh, given that learning with models involves um, uh, model building and model uh, development, we now need to ask, and this is the question that Frigg and Hartmann ask in their, in their entry in the Stanford Encyclopedia, is what are the constraints on model building and model manipulation in theoretical modeling? This is the question that I will try to answer today. And the key to the kind of answer that I want to provide is in constrained uses of imagination. So I'll try to develop a notion of uh, constrained in imagination that can do some uh, useful work for us with respect to uh, this question, to answering this question. Okay, one um, um, premise uh, that I should make explicit here is about a um, uh, desideratum of any theory of modeling, but in particular of uh, a theory or an account of how we learn with models. Um, and this is um, uh, the desideratum or the uh, theoretical principle of naturalism. Uh, naturalism is, uh, uh, the word naturalism has been introduced by uh, Frick in a paper from 2010, uh, and it applies generally uh, to uh, theories of model. Uh, I'm adapting it here to um, uh, an account of how scientists learn with models. And the key idea here is that uh, any such account should uh, be able to explain scientific practice. So when we look uh, at the scientific practice of modeling, uh, we can observe that uh, a modeler or a group of modelers working as a team or a community of modelers um, uh, what they do when they um, uh, build and uh, uh, develop a model is they, uh, first of all, specify a um, uh, model description. This is what we uh, are going to call this now. So model description is um, a description that can include mathematical and linguistic descriptions 
the mathematical one here is obvious, it's the equation. The linguistic description, the, the linguistic part of the description would be something like um, the um, uh, idealizations that I mentioned before. So the linguistic assumptions uh, that enable the mathematical um, description. And this description uh, specify uh, a model system in the way I described uh, before. Uh, the model system in this case with the ideal gas is um, the, the, the ideal gas system having those idealized properties we mentioned before. And um, scientists are aware of the fact that this system does not exist that they are, uh, so to say, uh, creating, constructing um, a surrogate of uh, a real world system in, in, in the imagination or in the model. Um, so they uh, specify through the model description an imaginary object uh, or an, an imaginary system um, um, working under imaginary conditions. So, Philosophers usually uh, recognize the importance of imagination in modeling. And I give you here a short list. There are many more names that I could add. Uh, we have uh, Nancy Cartwright, Roman Frigg, of course, with the uh, first robust development of the fiction view of, of models. Uh, we have Godfrey Smith, uh, Harry uh, Levy, myself, Adam Toon, uh, etc. So. Um, we all recognize the role of imagination in modeling. However, uh, there is no currently available explanation of the epistemic role of imagination in modeling. Um, there, is, there, there is a gap here. Imagination plays a role uh, in the scientific practice of modeling, uh, but uh, there, is, um, uh, there are many there is skepticism about uh, its uh, genuine uh, epistemic role when we talk about the kind of knowledge that models enable. Now, the plan for the rest of the talk is to um, uh, critically discuss two main varieties of imagination that are currently deemed crucial to scientific models. And I will uh, consider first Godfrey Smith's proposal that the counterfactual imagination is key to modeling, and then I will um, discuss uh, the notion of make-believe uh, that I myself have always preferred and that has been defended uh, uh, in the same collection from 2020 in the scientific imagination um, by, by myself and, and Robin Frigg. Uh, I will do this in a critical way, so we will find issues with this notion too, and I'll um, try in the second part of the talk to um, uh, address these issues by uh, presenting uh, a um, uh, tentative taxonomy of constraints operating on imagination in modeling. And then I will draw some conclusions about some further lines of research uh, for the future. Okay, so varieties of imagination in uh, modeling. So first of all, uh, let me give you a rough um, um, or kind of minimalist um, uh, description of uh, the uh, types of imagination that uh, are usually uh, discussed in the literature on um, models. Uh, we usually distinguish between um, sensory-like imagination and belief-like imagination. There are many more varieties contemplated by um, uh, philosophers and cognitive science working in other areas, but in the area of modeling, we have these two that are prominent. So sensory-like imagination is something like a mental relation to a representation, a representation of a real or non-existent entity in any sensory modality. So we can have, um, 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 visualizing, so imagining seeing, or we can have hearing, we can have uh, imagining tasting, imagining touching, imagining smelling. Um, these are all varieties of uh, the sensory-like imagination. As an example, uh, Mary imagines seeing a tiger, okay? 
Um, on the other hand, uh, you have what I here call belief-like imagination. And this is um, um, described in a sort of minimalist uh, way as a mental relation to some particular proposition or to some particular propositions uh, without any commitment to the truth of these propositions. And in this um, sense, this uh, minimalist notion of imagination uh, is akin to uh, a notion of acceptance, uh, perhaps of the kind that Stolnaker uh, um, uh, uses in uh, some of his uh, writings and in, uh, in his book, Inquiry. So Mary imagines that there is a tiger in the garden. This is the minimalist notion for belief-like imagination. Now, uh, most many philosophers of science and scientists themselves, when uh, talking about imagination and its role in modeling, uh, usually have in mind something like sensory-like imagination. And this, is, uh, this has uh, many reasons, but um, uh, one reason is that we do have evidence of <clears throat> the deployment of this type of imagination um, by scientists themselves who describe their own introspective reports of um, uh, activities that were key to the generation of new ideas, like, um, uh, for example, Kekulé's famous reverie, uh, his daydream uh, of a, a snake biting its own tail, which led him, uh, gave him the inspiration for solving the problem of um, um, uh, the structure of uh, Benzen. Um, other examples are provided by uh, uh, Maxwell and, uh, and others. I, I will not go into too many details here. The reason is that uh, the epistemic role of this type of imagination in modeling is currently disputed. So I have, uh, I add a reference to my work here, but uh, we're not the only ones who uh, are skeptical of the use of this notion uh, with respect to the epistemology of models. Um, uh, what what, what um, uh, Roman and I have said in, uh, in this uh, uh, book chapter that I mentioned here is that uh, this type of imagination doesn't seem to be either necessary or sufficient for um, uh, the modeling practice. Uh, if you think about the ideal gas model, forming a mental image of uh, the uh, um, point particles uh, or uh, of their interactions with each other, with the, um, um, uh, with the wall of the container, this does not seem to um, uh, play any role in the development of the model in the in the in how we build the model and in the development of the model itself what seems crucial um, for understanding the practice is um, grasping the theoretical concepts that are deployed in this context uh, the theoretical concept of uh, being a point particle so the kind of feature that a point particle has and by the way forming a mental image of a point particle is basically impossible i mean you can form a mental image of a proxy of that, uh, but not of a point particle, because uh, uh, by definition, the point particle has no volume. So uh, if you if you try, if you can, if you can just draw a point particle on a, on, a, on, a, on a paper, it's not going to be really a point particle, OK? It's just an approximate uh, representation of what you have in mind. To grasp uh, what a point particle is, you need a theoretical concept and so for everything else in that model. Okay, so I'm going to uh, now uh, leave aside this notion and then we'll focus on belief-like imagination because this is the crucial bit. Uh, so belief-like imagination, in this talk, um, I'm going to uh, focus on two main varieties of this notion, the counterfactual imagination and then uh, make-believe. And uh, I will uh, now focus first on counterfactual imagination. We have only a few slides on this, but uh, this is a very uh, natural way of interpreting the sort of imaginative um, activities uh, that characterize the model in practice. Uh, and this is because scientists, when they uh, build and when they develop their models, uh, explore 
alternative scenarios, alternative possibilities. In the case of the ideal gas model, clearly we have uh, a, a surrogate of a real world um, uh, uh, gas, of a real gas, and that can be considered as um, an alternative way um, um, a gas uh, could be in an ideal scenario, right? So it's a very uh, natural um, 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 kind of imagination uh, for this for this context, and um, the counterfactual imagination or counterfactual reasoning um, is a uh, subspecies of um, uh, our ability to engage in conditional thinking. Um, a counterfactual conditional, so conditional thinking, uh, conditional is something like if uh, A then C, okay? Um, when we have a counterfactual conditional, we have, uh, in this case, I use M for uh, the model assumptions. Uh, so we have an antecedent M and then a consequent C. So if M uh, then C, but in this case, because it's a counterfactual conditional, the antecedent is assumed to be false. It's a counterfactual uh, uh, antecedent. So M is assumed to be false. And we've seen that uh, in the ideal gas model, the assumptions are clearly false because uh, they are idealized assumptions. They are false with respect to the actual world. There is no real gas having those features. If there were a gas having these, and these features, however, the ones that are under the idealizations of this model, then that gas would behave like this. So it would behave um, as the consequence uh, tells us. We'll see um, some examples later. So we have a counterfactual conditional here. Uh, the best and the standard interpretation of counterfactuals that Godfrey Smith mentions, and that is usually assumed uh, either as um, uh, a framework for any development of uh, this, this, this kind of theory, or as uh, at least the point of uh, departure for such a development uh, is um, uh, provided by uh, Stolnacker and Lewis's different analysis, but similar uh, to a certain extent, um, different in the details, but they both share uh, the following claim, a counterfactual claim, sorry, the following thesis, a counterfactual claim is true in the closest possible world where the antecedent M is true and the consequence C is also true. Now, this notion of uh, closest possible world um, plays um, uh, a fundamental role for this, for this view, for the development of this view and uh, what we mean by closest possible world uh, uh, is closest to the actual world or uh, close, uh, closest to reality. So the key constraint that emerges from this analysis, the key constraint on imagination that emerges from this analysis is closeness or reality orientation or similarity, the similarity between worlds. Um, this is the, the initial uh, picture, the initial framework. Um, now, there are some uh, very well-known challenges for this framework, and uh, one of them is a general challenge, one that uh, a defendant of this framework may uh, be happy to live with anyway, but it's one that we should uh, make explicit from the beginning because it has consequences for uh, some specific challenges that apply to the case of modeling. Uh, the general challenge has to do with this notion of closeness. Uh, the notion um, uh, that emerges from this, um, uh, from Stolnacker's and Lewis's framework is uh, insufficiently characterized. Uh, Stolnacker appeals to the intuitive idea that the nearest or least different world in which uh, the antecedent is true is the one that should be selected. However, he does not provide any explanation of what least different means. So it's an intuitive, perhaps a, a primitive kind of um, uh, notion. 
Lewis, on the other hand, assumes a primitive notion of similarity of words. He says it explicitly. He's not interested in defining this. It's a notion that um, um, uh, provides the grounds for uh, the development of his um, um, semantics, possible world semantics. And um, this primitive notion of similarity leaves the notion of similarity itself unconstrained and mysterious, or so says um, uh, Arlo Costa in uh, another entry of the Stanford Encyclopedia on, on uh, possible words. Um, um, this is a very well-known challenge to this to this framework, but as I said, um, upholders of this analysis may just be happy to live with this. Uh, however, uh, this has consequences for the case of modeling. So the first specific um, uh, issue uh, that is raised by the use of this analysis in modeling is the issue of completeness. So possible words are complete. And yet scientific models cannot be said to be complete, at least not in the same way. Um, the notion of completeness is open for uh, dispute, but there is uh, a, an intuitive link between uh, completeness and the principle of excluded middle. According to this principle for any proposition P, it is the case that either P or not P holds. Uh, and yet there are many propositions that are neither true nor false in models. One of these propositions is a proposition that is true in the actual world. So Mont Blanc is the tallest mountain in Europe. And um, completeness requires that this very proposition be true also uh, in the idea, ideal gas model. Uh, if a gas were composed of point particles exerting no intermolecular forces, then Mont Blanc would be the tallest mountain in Europe. Uh, this statement, this conditional, counterfactual conditional statement is, um, according to this analysis, uh, true in the model. Uh, and yet uh, it doesn't seem to be uh, um, uh, correct. This doesn't seem to be correct. It doesn't seem to be a plausible thing to say. Even if you're not expert modelers, uh, I, I hope you have the intuition here that um, uh, whether Mont Blanc uh, is the tallest uh, mountain in Europe or not has nothing to do with the model. And so there's a problem about completeness there. I'm sure we can discuss this at some length. Uh, Timothy Williamson had his own reply to this uh, to this uh, objection. Uh, maybe we'll be able to discuss it later, but it's one that doesn't, doesn't really convince me. So we'll see. Um, okay, the second challenge, um, a specific challenge for the um, use of, um, for the deployment of uh, the counterfactual imagination in modeling uh, is uh, that um, it's about epistemic access and uh, it's about the fact that there is no general agreement on the epistemology of counterfactual conditionals. And this brings us back to the problem of uh, similarity and closeness. So Ackmant submits that our ability to gain counterfactual knowledge needs to be based on rules that permit us to determine which propositions are co-tenable with a given antecedent. This is a general challenge for any um, account of counterfactual conditionals. In the case of modeling, we have the more specific challenge, uh, which is uh, the one that starts from the premise that not all C's, not all consequences are true in the model. So uh, the proposition that Mont Blanc is the highest, um, uh, or the tallest mountain in Europe or the highest mountain in Europe uh, is, uh, not true in the ideal gas model, intuitively doesn't seem to be so. And um, identifying the rules of uh, counterfactual conditionals in modeling requires a previous understanding of a sort of tailor-made crossword similarity metric for each case, for each instance of modeling, for each model, or perhaps for some overarching types 
of cases, some types of models. So we need to um, identify uh, the uh, uh, criteria that we need to um, um, distinguish these, these different um, um, relations. Okay, the last one is intersubjective access. And the objection is that many imaginative activities are solitary and idiosyncratic, but modeling is a social practice. So uh, imaginative activities that are solitary and idiosyncratic are usually things like activities like uh, dreams or daydreams, but even the counterfactual imagination in itself, in its definition, um, could be such that it is performed as a solitary and idiosyncratic activity. Uh, however, the imaginative activities of modelers have a social dimension that cannot be explained merely in terms of the ways in which individual modelers think in their own subjective and idiosyncratic ways. So any account of modeling in terms of the counterfactual imagination lacks the theoretical resources to explain the social dimension of modeling. And this constitutes a, a further challenge for this, for this view. Not one that uh, cannot be overcome, but one that has not been addressed yet. So we don't have a solution to this problem. Now, the social uh, dimension of imagination in modeling is the key feature of, uh, sorry, of a different notion of imagination uh, that may be compatible in some of its instances uh, with that of the counterfactual imagination. And yet uh, it is also distinct from the counterfactual imagination. And this is the notion of uh, make-believe that I'm going to discuss uh, in the rest of the uh, presentation. Um, I have, again, uh, just a, a kind of minimalist uh, scheme here. And um, I'm going to illustrate this uh, to uh, point out the key features of this, of this uh, notion and of this framework. Um, um, we have a, um, um, a notion of make-believe that is inspired by Walton's uh, notion of a game of make-believe. It's not exactly the same, but it is uh, very close to Walton's um, uh, characterization. And uh, first of all, uh, a game of make-believe uh, is uh, a social, this is Walton that defines it in this way. It is a social imaginative activity involving props. It's a social activity, okay? It's not something that uh, um, uh, concerns only an individual uh, own, uh, an individual's own imaginative um, um, explorations. Okay, so it's a social imaginative activity involving props. Now, what are props? Props are material objects that make propositions uh, fictionally true in virtue of a prescription to imagine something, material objects, which means objects that can be perceived, that are physical objects, that are concrete objects. Now, a prescription to imagine something, and you see down here the principles of generation, we will spend um, a few minutes talking about them in a moment. Uh, these are social conventions explicitly stipulated or implicitly understood as being in force within a game, the rules of the game, okay? And these are conventions. Um, then we have a very important notion, the notion of um, uh, fictional truth. And uh, the notion of fictional truth is uh, very different from the notion of truth that is involved in the framework of the counterfactual imagination and of uh, counterfactual um, um, analysis of the, sorry, of the, the semantics of uh, counterfactual conditionals. Uh, fictional truth is, according to Walton, a property of those propositions that are licensed directly or indirectly by the prescriptions to imagine of a certain game. Uh, in this scheme, we have um, therefore, uh, the game of make-believe, social imaginative activity involving props. We have the props, we have certain uh, social conventions, and we have two types of fictional truth. We have uh, primary fictional truth, the original assumptions or the premises of the game, 
and then implied fictional truths, truths that are uh, generated from the primary uh, fictional truth or from the premises of the game or from the assumptions. Now, this is going to give us um, a, uh, a good um, uh, set of tools to explain first model building and then model development, which were the two key uh, steps that Morgan thinks uh, are relevant for an explanation of how we learn with models. So model building, let's talk through the ideal gas model uh, on this uh, proposal. Um, involves first the selection of a model description or the specification of a model description. Uh, in this case, we have the equation, but of course we also have the linguistic description of the idealizations. I don't have them on the slide, but don't forget that we have those two. And um, to work as props, uh, we need to um, refer to uh, the concrete marks on paper, on a computer screen, on a tablet, whatever you have. But the concrete marks, the concrete, the tokens of these symbols, the ones that you yourself can read on this slide that you can perceive, right? So the concrete physical scaffolding that make the social dimension of modeling possible. It makes it possible because we can share through perception these, um, uh, these marks. And uh, so they are intersubjectively available and they also provide us the scaffolding. So they provide us, they work as tools for supporting our cognitive uh, or the scientist's cognitive um, uh, activities. No scientist is uh, uh, capable of uh, developing a model without um, um, using, sustaining uh, the long-term reasoning process that goes on for uh, days, weeks, months, years sometimes without uh, uh, these, these concrete marks, okay? So first we select the model description and the concrete marks are the props of our game of make-believe. Uh, the model description prescribe imagining something. It prescribe imagining that in our case that the molecules, for example, the molecules composing the gas are point particles having no volume of their own and bouncing against each other in elastic collisions. Now, these are the model assumptions, uh, but these prescriptions to imagine, what they do is they specify the propositional content of the model's premises, of the model's assumption. So a model, when it is built, right, when we build a model, we have a kind of complex object that is constituted by the model description and its content, its, com its propositional content. This is um, uh, what we are going to use for explaining uh, model building. Uh, Notes again, I always emphasize this, that, that no object satisfies these properties, which merely specify an imaginary system. We've said this before a couple of times already. Okay. Then we have the model development. How does this work on this framework? We understand model development in terms of uh, the uh, activity, the exercise of drawing inferences, inferences that are made from the initial assumptions, our primary fictional truth. Uh, and uh, they are made uh, through uh, or in ways that are constrained by certain principles of generation, the rules of inference. So these inferences have correctness conditions only within the context of the make-belief. The inferences are the implied fictional truth, and these depend on the principles of generation in force in the model. We are still within the make-believe. The model development happens still within the make-believe. Um, the principles of generation. Now, this is where uh, uh, the, uh, the problems, I mean, the most difficult problems for this framework um, uh, come about, arise, because uh, Williamson himself, but it's, very, it's a very well-known problem for this um, for this uh, proposal, 
uh, uh, Williamson makes this explicit one more, once more in um, in a, um, a review article on um, on the uh, volume on the scientific imagination where he discusses um, um, the proposal Roman and I make in that volume, and he says, uh, "Well, you complain so much about the counterfactual imagination, saying that there are." Um, um, uh, issues there with the epistemology of counterfactuals, but actually there is no general agreement on the epistemology of make-believe either. So um, uh, he keeps, I mean, he prefers keeping uh, the, uh, the, the, the the other framework, uh, counterfactual imagination. Um, uh, I think that um, uh, here we have an opportunity for uh, developing this view by uh, studying uh, the sort of constraints that operate on make-believe in the case of modeling. So we can uh, get closer to a better account of the epistemology of make-believe in modeling uh, by uh, focusing on the constraints that operate uh, on, uh, in this practice on the kind of inferences that we make in modeling. And so I will uh, now, I don't think that I have a lot of time, but I only have a few a couple of more slides uh, on this. And so I will uh, say something about the constraints that I think are uh, relevant uh, for make-believe in modeling. And um, here they are. So I have this slide and I will just go through these items um, um, to explain um, how, how this uh, taxonomy is supposed to help us for the case of modeling. So this is a working hypothesis, uh, one that uh, should help us uh, study the right kind of constraints. And um, uh, I think that there are three main types of constraints on imagination and modeling. First of all, we have uh, architectural constraints that emerge from the literature in cognitive science on constraints on imagination across different contexts. So not pertaining to the context of modeling in particular, but to any context. Um, architectural constraints are determined by the cognitive structure of the imagination and they operate on all uses of imagination through context. Uh, two main uh, architectural constraints emerge from the literature in cognitive science and philosophy, and they are mirroring and uh, quarantining. So mirroring, briefly stated, is displayed by imagination when um, imagination, when the inferences that we make in imagination are uh, similar to the inferences we would uh, make um, in belief if we had um, isomorphic beliefs. So imaginings with the same propositional contents as uh, beliefs um, can engage in the same types of inferential practices and will lead us, will conduce us to the same kind of consequences. Now, of course, inference are never made in the void. They are always made um, um, with, the back, with some background information that is relevant in, in the context of making the inferences. And so mirroring will uh, interact with context specific constraints or contextual constraints uh, to draw the relevant kinds of inferences. Um, quarantining uh, is displayed by imagination when imaginings are not uh, conducive or when they do not, um, 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 when they are not um, uh, grounds for action. So they are not, take, they are not taken as uh, um, um, the basis for uh, acting in the real world. They are kept within the context of imagination and uh, they uh, um, are limited to that. Now, this does not mean that uh, nothing of real world importance can be learned from imagination. It simply means that uh, whatever we learn in the imagination uh, has to be exported outside of the imagination uh, as a sort of hypothesis uh, to uh, be... Um, um, Oh, sorry, there wasn't a lot, uh, to um, provide us the tools for learning. 
anything about reality. Okay, context-specific constraints. They are determined by disciplinary conventions and interpretative practices. And here we have, of course, Walton's principles of generation, inspired by Lewis, uh, Lewis's analysis of counterfactual. Counterfactuals, he uh, appeals to reality orientation, closeness, and mutual belief orientation. Uh, we've already seen the problems that exist for closeness in the context of modeling, and we need a way to uh, determine that uh, metric, uh, the tailor-made uh, similarity metric for models. So this is a, a kind of constraint that um, we need to work on to specify in the case of modeling. Mutual belief orientation is clearly uh, present in models when uh, scientists' uh, opinions and beliefs are relevant for the ways in which we develop a model or we uh, conduct our uh, um, um, procedures, our um, um, uh, strategies of model development. We have theoretical constraints. Theories are very important in uh, many types of modeling uh, practices, not all of them. But of course, in physics and in economics, theories play a very important role, um, less in biology, for example. Uh, mathematical constraints are present everywhere in the modeling practice. And especially in the case of the ideal gas model, we have theoretical and mathematical constraints at work there. Uh, there may be more. So this is an open list. And uh, um, the further I will anticipate it now because we don't have time to go through many more slides, but the, the further work that needs to be done in this context is that of um, uh, developing the case studies for um, identifying uh, the relevant kinds of constraints that work in the different modeling practices. Uh, then we have finally epistemic constraints. And they are determined by the particular epistemic purposes of an episode of imagination. So the type of knowledge that we want to acquire. Truth may be one of them, but not necessarily. You would be surprised uh, when talking to modelers to know how little uh, role, how, uh, how uh, little importance truth has in the, in the specification of the model description or the model assumptions and in uh, the development of the model. Reality orientation relates to this and it's, it has a very uh, limited role. Um, economics, one example for all. Uh, um, theoretical economics has a lot of uh, uh, these. Um, uh, fictional truth is definitely relevant if the development of the model happens in the imagination and the notion of fictional truth is what is relevant there then uh, this is the kind of constraint that we will have to uh, consider for uh, our knowledge of um, what is true in the model, which means what is fictionally true. Uh, and uh, justification. So there are many different types of justification. Justification is basically the grounds that probability our claims. Uh, when we talk about um, knowledge of reality or empirical knowledge, of course, empirical evidence is going to uh, play a very important role. Um, uh, testimony has its own uh, role, but in the case of modeling, we need to specify different versions of uh, justification, simply because in the case of um, when we develop the model, the kind of justification that we have there is definitely not of the empirical kind. Uh, so the sort of justification we have there may uh, actually use the contextual of the context specific constraints as its uh, basis. And so uh, we are justified in claiming something like the following. I will not go through this entire slide, but I will just give you the examples. Uh, the ideal gas is composed of point particles. Well, yes, that is true in the model in virtue of uh, the model, uh, the model's idealizing assumptions. Um, um, a comparison between what is true in the model and what is true in reality will have to rely on that uh, uh, notion of fictional truth, and we need to integrate it with um, uh, a slightly different um, um, set of constraints, uh, ad hoc constraints, 
that come uh, within the practice when we have model world comparisons. Uh, and uh, these again um, have to be determined by looking at the ways in which uh, scientists uh, make these, these comparisons. Uh, when we um, want to finally reach the, the, the end point of the game, that is uh, finally gaining some real empirical knowledge, knowledge of reality, uh, justification will be, of course, of the empirical sort. Uh, and um, uh, so we have knowledge claims that are exported from the game onto reality. And we have claims such as uh, the following example. If one doubles the number of moles of a real gas keeping pressure and temperature constant, the volume doubles too. That is a prediction that we make on the basis of what we've learned within the model. Uh, it can be exported first as a hypothesis, and then if we can test that, then we have a case of knowledge, knowledge of reality, okay? Uh, very briefly, I told you about the taxonomy. Let me just mention this. In conclusion, um, there are many different types of knowledge claims we can make about models. I just mentioned two, three actually, but I classify two of them under the same category. So one is knowledge claims about the imaginary uh, system that is specified by the model. And um, another one is knowledge claims about reality. But of course, there are uh, knowledge claims about possible alternatives, right? Uh, and these are knowledge claims made through models that sometimes are called exploratory models, models that explore alternative possibilities. There are also uh, knowledge claims about non existent phenomena or systems, like models of uh, three sex populations, right? Um, um, or models of um, um, in synthetic biology, where we have models of theoretical uh, phenomenon, theoretical systems that do not exist and that scientists are trying to uh, realize in the lab, uh, still not, not uh, being able to do that. So these systems don't exist. And then, of course, knowledge claims about theories. All of these different knowledge claims will uh, have different types of justification constraints and different types, possibly different types of uh, uh, truth constraints operating on them. And so this is another area that uh, needs to be further, further explored. OK, I conclude my talk here. And I have to thank you all for your patience. Thank you very much.